Your rig is about to be inspected. What's your job? Well, we're going to tell you. In part one of this series, we talked about types of wells and the kinds of defects that are found in them. But you'll remember that the main purpose of the program was to introduce the different types of non-destructive testing techniques that are used on our drilling units during annual inspections. We wanted to give you this information so that you could identify a certain type of weld and then prepare it for NDT without having an inspector talk you through every step. Also, we learned that most of the test methods require cleaning to bare metal. They are liquid penetrant, magnetic particle, ultrasonics. The other methods, which are electromagnetic detection, or EMD, and visual examination, or VE, require cleaning to good sound paint. This reduces cleaning or preparation time, and since repainting is not required, even more time is saved. The purpose of this program is to tell you in detail how to prepare a surface prior to NDT. We will also discuss your role during an inspection, and then we'll talk about repainting the surface. Repainting is particularly important on areas that are below the waterline, for the obvious reason that if the job is done wrong, it's difficult to do the job again. During an inspection, the barge engineer is in charge of the operation. More often than not, another person or two will arrive at the scene. These people will probably be Sedco Forex inspectors. Larry Harston is one of our inspectors. The annual inspection should be coordinated by a representative of the engineering department in Dallas who will be responsible for the inspection. These responsibilities include coordinating the efforts of the rigs personnel with those of the contract inspectors. He will assure that all areas requiring inspection are inspected properly and that the necessary reports are completed. He will also supervise the repair of any defects found during the course of the inspection. The inspection coordinator will work closely with the barge engineer, who may assign to you, as rig personnel, such duties as cleaning wells, opening and venting tanks, providing lighting, and erecting scaffolding. Our objective is to perform a complete and thorough inspection, as per type required, and get the rig safely back into operation in the minimum time possible. These inspectors definitely know what they're talking about. They may even have some advice that'll make your job easier and faster. Okay, let's say you've just heard that your rig is going to be inspected. What should you do? Well, first it'd be a good idea to find out what type of inspection is going to be done. In case you need to be reminded, a type 1 is the simplest inspection and critical connections are just about the only areas that need cleaning to bare metal. A type 2 requires a little more surface preparation and a type 4 requires quite a bit of cleaning. I told you that the first step was to locate areas that need to be tested. That task belongs to the barge engineer or the inspector. The forms we showed you in part 1 tell them which areas need to be inspected by which method. The forms are in the annual inspection section of the construction portfolio. There are pages and pages of information on the subject, but like I said, you don't need to be concerned with any of it. Let's say you know what type of inspection your rig is going to undergo. Make sure that the rig has plenty of rags, air hose, power cords, and power tools in good working condition. All too often, one of these things will come up, and a lot of time is wasted because these little things were not checked out beforehand. If your rig has a sand or water blaster on board, make sure they're in good repair before the time comes to use them. If personnel need to be trained in the use of any of these pieces of equipment, now's the time to do it. Don't wait until the work needs to be done. Most of the time, the areas above and just below the deck are cleaned while heading for sheltered waters, or at least before the inspection crew arrives. This enables the inspection crew to get to work as soon as they get on board. Let's say the inspection crew has arrived and you've received your first assignment. An inspector tells you he's going to use the EMD method on a crane pedestal butt weld. You'll remember that a butt weld looks like this. This is what an actual butt weld looks like. You should also remember that EMD requires cleaning down to good sound paint. 
As you can see, this weld is free of corrosion and good sound paint is covering it. So the weld is ready to be EMD tested. If the inspector wanted to MPI this weld, remember MPI stands for magnetic particle inspection, the area would have to be cleaned to bare metal. Which method would you use? Here are some basic guidelines. Below the main decks, sandblasting is used on large areas. Sandblasting is never done when there's a chance that the sand particles could damage machinery. Water blasting can be done in all areas as long as the sprayed water is not a problem. Power hand tools can be used just about anywhere, but obviously you wouldn't want to use a needle gun to clean a large area. So, don't sandblast where the sand could damage machinery. And don't water blast where water can cause problems. Let's go back to the crane pedestal. With the information we've just given you, either a water blaster or hand tools would be chosen to clean the weld. Since there really is not much area to be cleaned, hand tools would be the way to go. Here, we're cleaning the crown block shivs. He's cleaning the weld and about two inches around the weld. That'll be plenty of room to perform the test. Now we're going to talk about hand tools. Joel Katonin buys needle gun parts. Lots of needle gun parts. During an annual inspection, the most commonly used air tools you'll come across will be needle guns and air grinders. Needle guns are very simple. Take care of them, keep them lubricated, get them fixed as soon as something goes wrong. They can be very expensive though. One rig has spent as much as $15,000 on spare parts just for needle guns. Air grinders are a little different. You must take care of them, be careful. Keep the guards on them, check the RPM ratings for the wheels or stones. Before I came to work for Sedcar, I worked in a shop where an operator failed to check the RPM ratings and he removed the guard. Net result, he went to the hospital with a hole in his side about the size of my thumb. One piece went off through two sheets of half inch plywood. Take care of them, be careful. Scrapers are very simple tools. You use them when removing marine life. When using these, just be sure that you don't take off more than you have to. By this I mean don't dig the corner into the steel. This could damage the zinc layer which protects the steel from rust. Grinders are used to investigate potential defects and to remove cracks that are found. Power hammers can be used to perform the same tasks that needle guns do. They do the job much faster, but look at what they do to the deck. For this reason, don't use a power hammer unless there's no other choice. And never use a power hammer on a weld. There's a chance it'll damage the weld, and there's a real good chance that any cracks that may exist in the weld will be hidden. It's also a good idea to wear ear protection when working with power tools. For the larger areas, you're going to use either a sand blaster or a water blaster. Both of these pieces of equipment are potentially dangerous. A water blast unit works at between 5 and 10,000 PSI. Most of the time you'll be using around 6,000 PSI. That's enough pressure to cut through a railroad tie. So needless to say, extra safety equipment is needed. Special training is also required before operating a water blaster. Probably the most important safety items are the foot protectors. If you're not wearing them and the stream of water hits your foot, you might as well say goodbye to it because it'll cut it off. I don't really think I need to tell you why you need to wear the rain gear, so we'll move on to the face shield. It's worn to keep paint chips out of your eyes and away from your face. The nozzle should be at least 48 inches long. That should be long enough to keep you from cutting off your foot. Sandblasters aren't used much anymore because of the problems the sand poses to the environment. But in case your rig has sandblasting equipment, here are some things to look out for. First, don't do any sandblasting unless you have the proper training and safety gear. Without the proper training, there's no way to know which type of abrasive to use or what size of nozzle you need. As far as safety equipment goes, leather coveralls should be worn to protect the operator from the sand, which will bounce back at him after it hits the steel. The most important piece of equipment is the air-fed hood. The hood protects the operator's eyes from the sand and it supplies air to him. Without an air-fed hood, an operator would breathe in an awful lot of dust and that dust can be harmful, especially when blasting on toxic paints or coatings. 
The hood can be fed with air from a separate compressor, or it can be fed by normal rig air. In both cases, the air must pass through a breathing air filter. The actual sandblasting is pretty simple. Remember that when we sandblast on our rigs, we do it so that we have a white metal surface. A white metal surface is over 99% free of rust or any other contaminants. So blast the area so that it looks something like this. There's no real trick to sandblasting. Just remember to move the nozzle in a consistent pattern over the steel. When working over irregular shaped areas like this girder, keeping a consistent pattern may not be possible. Just make sure all the rust is removed. Quite often, sandblasting is not used because of all the dust that's created. Now, there is a method of adding water to the unit. As you can see, this greatly reduces the amount of dust in the air. There may still be a problem with the sand, of course. You're still dumping about 10 pounds of sand for every square foot of blasted area, and that sand has got to go somewhere. We said earlier that this job is a dangerous one. Climtex representative Norman Wren tells us how dangerous it can be. The nozzle is a weapon. It's like a gun. You must be aware the direction is pointed. The sand, the abrasives coming out of it uh, could be harmful. Uh, he must be aware at all times his position. Quite often, scaffolding, or staging as it's called in the UK, is needed to get to the section of the tubulars that they call the knuckles. The top of the knuckle can be reached fairly easily, but to get to the bottom of the joint, some sort of scaffolding is required. Rope scaffolding is used only as a last resort. Welded frame, steel cable with cable clamps, and pipe scaffolding are all preferred to rope, but sometimes it's still used. You're going to need a couple of 4x4s, at least two 2x8 or 2x10s that are about 8 feet long. Hardwoods are recommended, and thicker boards certainly are not discouraged. The rope should be 3 quarter to 1 inch thick and in good condition. The 4x4s, which are called bones, should be notched so that the rope will sit in the notches. To start with, place the boards on the deck so that the 4x4s support the 2x10s. Then, measure off about 10 feet of rope. Next, place a section of rope over the top of the boards, then cross the two pieces underneath the 2x10 and inside the 4x4. Pull some slack above the board. You'll find out why in a minute. Put the two ends underneath the board and cross them again. Pull them straight out this time. Now, take the loop and stretch it over the end of the board and tighten both ends of the rope. Lifting the boards makes this easier. This knot is called a scaffolding hitch. The next step is to tie a bowline knot with the two ends. Make a small loop five or six feet from the board in the longer rope. Take the other end and put it up through the hole, then go around the loop and then back through the hole. Then pull on the rope until the knot tightens. Adjust the knot so that the board will hang level. Adjustments can be made both at the boards and at the bowline. When both sides are rigged, the platform can be dropped over the side, over a pontoon, or brought to wherever it's needed. If you're going to be doing this for the first time, review this section several times and ask the barge engineer to oversee the construction of your scaffolding. It's also a good idea to practice the knots before the time comes to use them. And don't forget to wear a lifeline but avoid supporting personnel with air tuggers. Sky climbers are designed specifically for this purpose. The drive motor is located in the basket and the cable is secured at deck level. Rig welders have a major role during annual inspections if defects are found and if the welders are qualified. Defects are removed either by grinding or by air gouging. In most cases, they're gouged. A welder can't repair a weld, though, unless he's certified by ABS or an equivalent agency. If one of our inspectors is on board, he'll probably be able to give the welder a repair procedure to follow. Sometimes, when a major repair is necessary, the inspector may have to consult the rig's unit office. So I hope this makes it clear that you welders should not take it upon yourself to repair a weld. Once the area has been tested, 
all the areas that were clean to bare metal have to be repainted. Like I said before, this is very important. The most important step in the painting process is the surface preparation. Before you coat the surface, make sure the area is free of rust, oil, or grease and salt. If you paint over one of those contaminants, this can happen to your paint. We looked at some of these chips under a magnifying glass and found salt crystals. So before you paint over an area, wash it clean. The next thing people fail to do is feather the edges. If you don't feather the edges, the paint won't adhere properly and corrosion will form. It may take a little time, but at least you won't have to do the job again. Now let's review. When you're asked to clean a well for testing, you need to know what kind of testing technique will be used. Here's a list of the non-destructive testing techniques that require cleaning to bare metal. Liquid penetrant, magnetic particle inspection, and ultrasonics. Good sound paint can cover wells if they're tested by the electromagnetic detection method or by visual examination. You may have heard of other types of non-destructive testing like x-ray. These types of testing are used on our rigs during new or reconstruction of things like crane pedestals. The x-ray technique is not used during annual inspections, however. Quite obviously, x-rays are dangerous, so if you hear that x-rays are being done, you'd be wise to stay away from the test area. If scaffolding needs to be built, try to use pipe, steel cable, or even welded steel before making rope scaffolding. If you haven't made it before, then have the barge engineer or some other experienced party oversee the construction. That concludes our annual inspection series. We hope that you now have a grasp of your role during an inspection and that you know which equipment to use on which areas of the rig.